So I don't think that my building need to mitigate the climate. I can depend on the air conditioner. And then I want air conditioner to be more energy efficient, you know. Green definition has also altered that now green is making points tally up to certain score. If you want to have in two years Mercedes and an apartment to yourself, then work accordingly. Subscribe to Bless Dark for your dose of art, architecture and design and hit the bell icon so you never miss an update. Hey yo guys, welcome back to Bless Dark. Now today is a very special episode because today we have with us architect Yatin Pandya. Yatin Pandya is an author, academician, researcher as well as a practicing architect with his firm Footprints Earth. Graduate of SEPT University, Ahmedabad, he has availed a Master's of Architecture degree from McGill University, Montreal. He has won over 38 national and international awards for architectural design, research, as well as dissemination. In his own words, his work yearns for environmental sustainability, socio-cultural appropriateness, timeless aesthetics, and economic affordability. I am thrilled that he's going to be on the channel today. So without wasting much time, let's get started with our conversation. Now, before we start the interview, I just wanted to let you know that Bless Dark is on Patreon. Once you become a patron, you not only get access to bonus videos, like the extended conversation from this video as well, but you will help support Bless Dark and make the community bigger and more connected with people all over the world. So do consider supporting. The link is in the description below. Now, let's start our conversation. So I remember when I was still studying and, uh, you know, uh, there was one semester where uh, Professor Madhura Yadav was uh, one of our guides for our architectural design. She used to keep telling us that, you know, to go and read your book to, to help us understand, help us be better designers. So I think it is a great, great opportunity to have you here today. I mean, it gave me an opportunity to explore your projects much more. So I, I first wanted to thank you for being on this channel and taking out the time. Thank you. And it's my pleasure and honor to be here. So I'm very glad to be chatting with you. So I want to revolve our discussion today around green building and sustainability, because one thing is pretty clear that climate change uh, and the effects of it are becoming more and more uh, visible. I mean, to the world over. And I think that is something we, the and younger designers, it is something that is not an add-on to a project, but I think it is becoming, it has become mandatory to make it essential that our projects do respond to, to our environment around it, are sustainable. But what does that really mean? So I want to explore that with you today. And so um, the very first thing that I wanted to ask you is, especially with the climate crisis of the 21st century, we are talking more and more about sustainable solutions. So do you think there's a problem in how the industry all over the world is looking at or defining green or sustainable infrastructure? Yeah, one, I think it's an aftermath of a lot of things that we did before, many more in recent past, that is. And second, the whole undue liberties that we took, if I talk about building industry, then as designers, in giving more predominance and dependence on mechanized services, rather than using the common sense to first address those issues with fundamentals of design rather than the prop of accessories and so on and so forth. So that's what has unduly cropped up the demand and then we are trying to find solution through either a gadget or so and so. Let me go directly that we would like to have energy saving bulb so that we can save energy. But have our designs uh, in recent past questioned the logic of a blank black out corridor in a hotel or a kind of a hospital or so and so, so you know, doubly loaded corridor with no light, no view, no ventilation, you know. And what gave us that liberty? Why our toilets today have to depend on a forced mechanized ventilation like exhaust or so? You know, earlier if that ventilation was not there, a student would fail at an exam or a you know course because that was seen to be most fundamental that these have to be 
done through natural means and not by mechanized services. So first, undue dependence on that. You know, we all talk about uh, that, okay, how could you get the light and the ventilation in the middle core of the uh, built form? Now, that is where we had the wisdom of putting a puncture in the middle, which was like courtyard organization. If not, you know, there was a kind of always a jagged profile so that no space would be beyond the ingress of natural light and the effect of ventilation and so on and so forth. So I think this fundamental principles have been forgotten in the kind of wake of dependence on the mechanized services. So I don't think that my building need to mitigate the climate. I can depend on the air conditioner. And then I want air conditioner to be more energy efficient, you know. Instead, what used to be done is that first your built environment itself, built form itself, would be conducive to the forces of nature first. And then as a supplement for a little time, you might need some mechanized services or so. I think now it's just been taken for granted that all offices have to be to begin with air conditioned, you know. So even if places like Bangalore, if it's 25 degree outdoors, you still have to run. You go to a hotel, you don't even have a control over your window openings. So it's a fixed glazing. So even if it's cool in the night at the, uh, you know, in the outdoor temperature, you still have to run an AC inside to get the same temperature as outside, you know. So that's the kind of fallacy that we need to. So that is one part. And with that, therefore, what we have derived is a checklist. So rather than the kind of addressing the principle, we say that, okay, if I use the five star X machine, I have already complied to my call of sustainability or green and likewise. And that's where that green definition has also altered that now green is making points tally up to certain score rather than right from the beginning using the fundamentals of design to address the call of culture, climate and construction, you know. So in that sense, green has become Meravala green. For me, it is one, for you, it's another, for somebody, it's another. So I think that's where we need to address earlier, you know, it, it, it is wrong to say that it's only now people have been sensitive to that. People now have been compelled to be sensitive to that because of the excessiveness of that dependence, what it has brought us to. Earlier, climate addressing the climate was the fundamental of any design. And that would be expected by a client. And that is something that in terms of education, you are always harping on that don't flout these basic norms of environment management or conditioning of the uh, built environment and so on and so forth. So I think it's that undue liberty that we took in recent past that has kind of uh, given this sort of, and that has also been basically by succumbing to glamour of certain material. For example, steel and glass and the glamour of glass has uh, taken precedence over the undue discomfort that it would bring in because of its transparency in a hot climate where radiation is high, where ingress of heat is very high. But I think it's that becoming fashionable uh, rather than, uh, you know, comfortable. And that now demanding, therefore, internal environment management through artificial means. Questioning what is green. Green is to be with nature in every other thing that you do. The whole way of thinking and working and as a designer taking that sort of principles fundamentally in the kind of way you take your design decisions is the important part where the front seat is taken up by the gadgetry and machine instead of principles of a good design. I wanted to move our discussion from, you know, uh, from individual buildings to, to talk a little bit about smart cities. Um, it is a concept being looked at all over the world. And even India had this endeavor, uh, had this announcement of many cities being converted to smart cities, uh, which obviously I think is a bit derailed because of the COVID situation. So when the smart city concept is applied to India, how does it need to be morphed? And what are the challenges that we are looking at? Like green, even smart is a misused word. I mean, there's no dictionary that would give a meaning of smart being dumb. 
But if you see, and usually in my presentation, I always show this image first, that typically the steel and glass skyscraper as the image of a smart city, then we need to wonder, is this a vision or is it simply a slogan? You know, then smart can be a dumb, okay? So it's what we are trying to go after. Because if that is the idea of smart, then we need to wonder, have our cities which have sustained and are lived in for thousands of years been dumb all along? Contrary to that understanding, those cities have been performing the best with the most optimal resource consumption. They were compact. You could walk from place to place, so the least dependence on the cars. They had multi kind of activity within the neighborhood, so you, you could walk just a couple of minutes to get your grocery and few things. You were very close to the school. You were close to social infrastructure like temples or mosques or whatever. And you didn't need to depend on the car unless you wanted to travel far distance. And that time, public transport was available, whatever sort, you know. Then the buildings were built such that, you know, like electricity was invented, I don't know, maybe one and a half century ago. So do we mean to say that before that people were miserable, they were sweating, etc.? You go to most of these uh, monuments which are built pre-electricity days and you find quite comfort within that. So instead of those kinds of built form, now we want to invent something which is alien to the context. I'm not saying... It, there's nothing to say modern as uh, forward and traditional as backward. That's a fundamental fallacy in our mindset. I think what is most appropriate is what we have to look at. And traditional architecture by default have been most appropriate on their performance count. So what I'm trying to get at is that there was a wisdom of the vernacular in a given place. So. If we simply throw that out, you know, smart cities should have identified the characteristics of each place and enhance the virtues of that. And of course, facilitate with some anomalies or shortcomings, you know, may it be infrastructure, may it be some amenities, etc. But I think it should have built on the ethos, the DNA of the given place, you know. Instead, we are trying to just kill that and homogenize it with some alien kind of a model, alien model of transportation, alien model of kind of a, a not mixed zone development, alien model of a, sort of a vertical living, which is culturally and climatically totally devoid. And it's also wrong kind of, because there's been not proper study done on these uh, you know, findings or to understand this. For example, oh, we are mega city, we must now only promote the high rises. But if you see the old city like Ahmedabad, UNESCO recognized, so which means that it has been found worthy of living, has 2.7 FSI on a plot. And that is the highest FSI that you can get today, even if you build high rises. So from six centuries, if people were able to build such high density in a low rise, no air elevator kind of condition with without AC comfortable living, which also encourage the social mixing, etc. One of the most interactive neighborhoods, one of the most festive neighborhoods. You know, you go kite flying, then you go to Old City. So if these are the kind of qualities that we have and diverse values, very kind of, uh, you know, colorful in terms of individual uh, activities, festivities, day-to-day -day routine, so if that is the kind of variety that you find there, if we would have strengthened on that and then added additional things, so whether our building bylaws, if we could have studied, analyzed, and recognized the virtues of the built form and then came up with the kind of bylaws in sympathy to that, learning from that wisdom, rather than throwing that away and creating something so alien today. So I think that is the part of the smart city, which is questionable as smart and more likely as dumb. Fundamentally solving any problem is defining the question, first of all. And I think that is what we need to do when we're looking at maybe smart cities. Um, so I know you've given us many examples uh, while uh, we are discussing, but I wanted to know some projects. And uh, I was thinking now let's move uh, 
um, maybe two modern projects designed by you or anybody else that can help be a model to understand what green and sustainable architecture can look like yeah as i said that uh, you know some example i would give are <clears throat> not because who did it it's not about personality but it was the ba- basic thing to do pre so called you know this sustainable movement you know that is a created movement and i'm glad that that kind of awareness is there but that doesn't mean that it is something that suddenly has come in you know i would say that milonos association building by lee kobuz here here in amdabad now it has been 70 plus years now and that many years ago in keeping with modernism which was argued to be very self centered and ego centric with the architect etc and from a firang architect coming to the local context and it showed us the application of bri soleil so that it has the kind of a waste facing facade aesthetic created out of an inclined fins where you could get the southwest breeze which was a smart idea so you get ventilation but you don't get the direct western sun as the glare coming in so you get enough illumination you get cross ventilation but you don't have to have the haze and the glare and the kind of uh, heat of the direct sun that was not replicated all over so eastern facade which overlooks the river is a perpendicular fin this fins were grown with vegetation so even when the south western breeze came in it picked up little bit of humidity it became little cool and you also got greenery on the upper floor that also meant that it was as i said sort of aesthetically timeless because of the shadow pattern that it creates in sun which changes every time you take a photograph or look at it same way the vegetation grows differently in different season it has grown it has decayed it has again grown so it's constantly changing dynamic facade in that sense you know so it's breathing it's very kind of dynamically changing and therefore very inviting or very kind of dynamic uh, in its uh, visual so it doesn't wear off and it is giving there's no air conditioning there uh, giving you the kind of comfort uh, that you probably and there's a cross ventilation many areas non programmed areas simply kind of uh, rely on this cross ventilation and so on and so forth so way back in the core modernism after that if you say mr doshi and his own building the sangat his own studio that was a very simple that partly subterranean architecture so the earth burning and therefore in a hot dry climate the insulation from external condition cavity wall so that you could retard the heat ingress from outside in then the ceramic fuses so hollow clay tile kind of roof added with china mosaic so ventilation sorry the insulation from the roof uh, then the vaulted form so minimum surface area for maximum volume within so optimization of space three dimensionally in that sense then north glazing so you get enough daylight ventilation i mean uh, illumination rather than having to artificially kind of illuminate even for a kind of a minute task that we as architects have to do there you know and then the microclimate through vegetation recycling of the water so way back in 1980 when that building was done 80 81 uh this was what was employed and for a very long time it was not air conditioned so that's coming to the kind of later phase and if i take some examples of contemporary you know uh, like i'll take some of our projects not because they are the best but uh, different so it's a concept it's a phenomenon and not a formula and that's one of the mistakes we make with this notion of uh, sustainability that we tend to put it into the points we tend to put it in a list list as a good wish list is fine but approach to carry that out may differ from place to place you know so let me run through few examples at different scales and in different kind of approaches all towards the same goal so <clears throat> starting from very one of the recent project recent meaning couple of years ago of which uh, we were also awarded the citation from the united nations world habitat award uh, where uh, simply in a slum house where three sites are shared with the neighbor 
the last room invariably is pitch dark and therefore quite warm because of the corrugated sheet on top. There's no ventilation, there's no view. So we were asked to do something by uh, Maila Housing Trust of uh, Seva. And uh, we tried to address it from the rooftop, like a dormer window and stuff like that. Very low cost solution. But with that, it has been over thousands of uh, people uh, uh, applied to and one year's study has shown minimum 250 to 300 rupee monthly electricity bill saving after this installation and about 1500 rupee monthly increase in the economic home-based activity because they used to work at home and do things. Now they could work for longer hours. Their stress level on the health and eye was reduced. So how a small thing could improve the quality of life and really be meaningful and that multiplied over several hundred homes has even largely contributed to the city's kind of uh, conditions, you know. Now, when we did this uh, kind of a very uh, affordable cost, uh, set up community center, I call it, rather than a school because it was used multiply uh, through the day in a slum itself. There, we had this approach of recycling the waste material, waste from domestic sector, from municipal sector, from the second-hand market, or even some of the semi kind of worked upon. So transferring the waste, converting that into a building component. You know, that project has been done like a demonstration. So it's a collage of various ways through recycled ways you can make walls. Walls out of plastic bottles as a brick. Walls out of, you know, liquor bottles uh, uh, out of brick. Uh, walls out of the crate wood, which wood is expensive, but crate wood being brittle is usually used for burning. Here it makes a partition. So number of these variations and of course, uh, whether it was a cement uh, substituted by soil stabilized block or whether it was the sand substituted by some inert material from dumpfill site and likewise so many such blocks uh, were also created so number of these alternatives were tried there as a demo to show that some of these need not be a waste they could turn into a much usable and more effective solution where it would solve the problem of housing by having at the same or a cheaper cost, a better property of material. It would add the value and through that addi value addition, you give employment to the have nots and especially the gender because the women used to be employed in this, so gender parity. And third, because you don't throw it, there is a kind of, a, you know, idea of sa saved pollution. So less pollution and likewise. So this is how this center demonstrated many different dimensions of sustainability there. So it was a quite different approach. And of course, it is not air conditioned. So the climatic response is one of the basic that you have to address. And finally, if I come to a memorial, because it's not only about Dukhi architecture, we have done one memorial, memorial for Kerala Pharma. And the entire 30 acre development is purely by five basic elements. There's very little built. It's molly, the modulation of land. It's vegetation of 120 species. It is the water in different forms. Uh, and it is the light and the seasons. Uh, so it's all created by that. So this is the kind of way all these projects in a way show that basically you just have to factor in in your design consideration nature the forces of nature as well as the resources as nature. And then your solution comes around them. It's not a, it's like treating each contextually relevant. So not using one formula to all. That's why it took a little longer explanation to explain different projects where a small installation, like putting in a, you know, empty water bottle to get a light to Ujasiu, that kind of a dormer window with a translucent cover all the way to uh, all these different scales. And different scale was also to show that it can work at all the levels, not just for slum housing or affordable condition, but even for the rich. So that's the kind of way. I think we need to just simply be a little more aware and responsible as well as responsive to the context. True, and thank you so much for, I mean, 
through those various projects i think uh, we saw different different examples of what you were uh, trying to talk about in the previous question as well and we saw the different you know strategies applied to different different projects as per their need as per what the project was about so thank you so much for that there's one final question that i wanted to ask and this i ask all uh, the guests that come on the channel so my channel primarily uh, focuses on uh, students and fresh graduates so i wanted to ask any advice that you would have for uh, students who are passing out or fresh graduates out there yeah i would not call it advice i would just say what i believe in uh, and i hope my saying it not because i have bald head but i have also gone through phases uh, where i had to start fresh all over again and what not so what i want to say is that believe in what you believe in be yourself and there is always an avenue for that okay so if you want to have in two years mercedes and an apartment to yourself then work accordingly so you know what you're getting into and all but if you know what you want and you pursue that there'll be no disappointment because there is always satisfaction of what you do and that doesn't mean that you starve and you go hungry so number 1 there is a room for all kinds of approaches so you make up your own mind about what you want to pursue don't compare but what you want to pursue you because people would come to you for what you are so if you want to fake it you would not be able to win the race for a long because you will neither be yourself and satisfied with you what you do you won't be able to put in your own everything and then client one day would say oh but you should have told us we told you to do this but you should have told us that it was not right so there is no win win there but uh, at least pursue what you believe in have conviction and then sincerity you know i was once told by one of my classmates that uh, it's probably the style that matters in this world not the sincerity and i would say make sincerity your style okay so anything that you believe in pursue honestly sincerely and that always takes you somewhere and if you involve yourself you would never be bored of a monday morning 9 o'clock the day you feel tired oh my god again monday 9 o'clock i have to start work then you must retire so every day think a fresh what you know till yesterday is in your pocket nobody will take it away but what is it that i get today okay and that's why even if you have a similar program and project have you been that many days or that many years wiser than before aware than before how do you do that so the number of f- factors and concerns that you put in your own work would give you that much of excitement that much of complexity and that much of something to look towards so don't give up on those concerns so you can cheat everybody but not yourself and yourself meaning the kind of things that you set in for yourself to achieve so if you think that this project is for money do it that but then find your own game goal or the play field in any project even if it's a free project find out that what can i pursue that i have not pursued and therefore this is an opportunity to do that you know many of the slum projects have been not for fees but then those have given me the maximum uh, creative urge as well as uh, recognition awards etc but uh, you tried something there which also helped them and which also became your playful and then no project is boring no project is a burden and that is where you can give your best and that's what what you're capable of that's where your creativity is so it's not trying to do something different it is just being appropriate to the place people and program that's basically what it is about yeah that actually really really wonderful advice i think one of the best advices we've had uh, from our speakers and uh, it it i think it speaks to a lot of people especially when they are out and you know figuring out i think being authentic especially that part and understanding what you want to derive from the profession as well uh, keeping that as your focus as well going forward i think it can help a lot of people you know we always thought that okay we are probably overgrown in our population and this planet cannot help hold so many people <coughs> on itself but pandemic showed that we were the same number of people 
But undue systems getting out of the way, air cleaned up itself, water cleaned up itself, and <clears throat> a lot of other positive things that emerged. Now, there again, a very simple and holistic principle. So the whole built form derived out of this. So right from no import or export of soil for filling the level above. Instead, we need cut and fill very mathematically that you cut this much to this depth and the same soil you put on your rest of the site. So you don't have to fill up the land. Even it was in the way outskirts where the highways came later and therefore the filled land, uh, the filled land, which would originally what it would have been, was lower than the road and it would become a cesspool. You know, you don't have to be flamboyant batsmen who hit six, you know, few sixes, but gets out when the team needs you. You can be a wall like Dravid, where they know you for who you are, but you are at least dependable for your contribution. So uh, that was our last question. I wanted to thank you. Thank you for taking out the time. Thank you for such brilliant advice. And, uh, you know, no. talking to us. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thanks for having me and good luck and all the best to everyone. Let's stay positive, let's remain creative, and let's be ourselves. Thank you.